Welcome to committee. Thank okay, you. I'm very nervous because I've never done this before, and I am a doctor, but I am a PhD. I'm not a medical physician, so don't ask me any medical questions, please. Um, I've been trying to write down what the appropriate language is. I don't know what it is. I think I'm supposed to say thanks to the chairman, thanks to the vice chair, thanks to the ranking member. Okay, thank you everyone for allowing me to speak today. Um, <laughs> I have a couple of amendments. The, name, the title of my testimony is um, History Repeats Itself, Parallels Between the Civil Rights Movement and the Forced Vaccination Movement, okay? And then when I said something about HIPAA, I found out today that my statement was not correct, so I changed that to the basic right to privacy, okay? All right, I am the descendant of slaves and indigenous people. And because of that, I am here to urge our representatives to support HB 248, because I remember history and I do not want to repeat it. My paternal great-grandmother, Huida Williams, was born on a plantation in Bullock, Alabama, and she lived there until she was six. Eventually, she and her family moved north and settled in Ohio. I knew her very, very well, and I used to visit her a few times a month. She died when I was 11 years old. My maternal grandfather, Joseph Tolliver, had to leave Birmingham, Alabama with his brother, William, because they were so outspoken about discrimination and equality for blacks that they were repeatedly threatened with lynching. So Joe and Maddie, his wife, also moved to Ohio. Prior to leaving the Magic City, which is what my grandmother, Mama Maddie, used to call Birmingham, because she thought when she came north that there were all these cows and fields and stuff. She said they used to wear gloves to go to the grocery store, so she couldn't understand how the north was so much better than the south, okay? But prior to um, coming to Ohio, she was a Sunday school teacher at 16th Street Baptist Church. Had she and Joe not moved north, she would have been in the basement where those four young girls, Addie Mae Collins, who was 14, Cynthia Wellesley, who was 14, Carol Robertson, who was also 14, and Carol Denise McNair, who was 11, and they were all blown up. And I might not be here today. My parents, Nina and Kenneth, did what they could to stand for justice and equality during the Civil Rights Movement so that I, when I was born in 1968, was free and had the same privileges under the law as everyone else. But a vaccine mandate will change that. Any student of history clearly sees the distinct parallels between segregation due to race and segregation due to vaccine status. Inherent in this discriminatory practice is the understanding that what is happening in COVID or whatever the next fear-driven narrative connected to illness is will become the next battle for civil rights. Government-sanctioned discrimination based on skin color is no different than government-sanctioned discrimination based on vaccine status. The unvaccinated will become second-class citizens just like blacks once were. During the Civil Rights Movement, blacks fought against unjust laws. Today, citizens are fighting against the tyranny of government officials and the bullying from people in their daily lives who expect them to relinquish their God-given freedoms upheld in the Constitution to the state and to obey mandates, mere words of men, which are not laws. In slavery, blacks were masked for several reasons, to dehumanize, to shame, to silence, to isolate, to punish, to emphasize otherness, and to incite fear. Blacks also had to show their papers to prove that they had freedom of movement off and on the plantations owned by their masters. How are the COVID masks, social distancing, tracking and tracing, and vaccine passports of today any different than the tools used by the oppressors of yesteryear? They aren't. Fear and intimidation were used on blacks then, and it is being used in the exact same way on citizens now. Fear is psychological warfare. When the mind is controlled by fear, then one's body and movements can also be controlled. And let me add, what did Roosevelt say? We have nothing to fear but fear itself. Lockdowns, masks, tracking and tracing, and vaccine mandates are abusive because they are systematically stripping away the freedoms of citizens to choose for themselves the best course of action for their health. 
The idea of mandatory vaccinations for people to keep their jobs smacks of the same abusive legislators that have, abuse that legislators have historically used against whatever people group they perceive to be inferior. Forced vaccinations, medical passports, tracking and tracing are all forms of medical apartheid. And I would encourage you to read Harriet Washington's book, which I have in the back, that's called Medical Apartheid. I have several physicians in my family. A couple of them have taken the, the vaccine and have had adverse reactions, tremors, and their parents, who are also physicians, have decided that they're not taking it for that reason. One of my cousins went into anaphylactic shock shortly after taking the vaccine. These processes are obviously discriminatory, and it's horrific to think that what people are enduring today is a repeat performance of the past. Will COVID or future illnesses and all that they entail spark a new movement for equal justice under the law? Currently, disparate treatment runs rife across this nation, spreading like wild, wildfire, demanding in exchange for job security and participation in society the injection of medical treatments that are devoid of both FDA approval and legal recourse when damaging side effects occurs is draconian at best and criminal at worst. What's, what happened to my body, my choice, don't ask, don't tell. The basic right to privacy. Those who love freedom must act before it's too late. Please support HB 248, respectfully. Thank you very much for your testimony, and thank you for being with us today. You did a great job. You didn't seem nervous. <laughs> My heart is thumping. We'll start the question of this series with Representative Young. Thank you very much. Um, uh, the reason I like your testimony is that you are spot on about what this bill is. It's a freedom bill. Uh, I am no expert on medicine. Me neither. I am no expert on um, anything other than just taking care of myself and my kids. And um, as a matter of fact, when I get a vaccine, I pass out. So, um, but let's talk about the civil rights movement. And I have a question for you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chairman, to the witness. I hope I can answer. Do you see, uh, this is my fear, and you were spot on. Do you see the possibility, because we're seeing we, there are elements of this around the nation, but do you see this as uh, the next step in wearing a T-shirt that says V on it if you have a vaccine? and a T-shirt that says NV on it where there's no vaccine and you have to sit at the back of the bus? That's my fear. I mean, I know just from my own personal experience, and again, I have a PhD in English literature. I speak three languages. Um, I don't have a background in history. I just know based on the things that my parents have gone through, my grandparents went through, my great-grandparents went through. They taught us the importance of freedom, freedom of choice. Right. So to me, I think that I'm already seeing things like that. I haven't really worn a mask since all of this started, but that has severely restricted my movement. I don't go to the grocery store anymore. And when I do, I'm praying before I walk in, Lord, please don't let anybody say anything to me because I don't want to have to get crazy <laughs> so that I can go get groceries. I do a lot of, of shopping where they're, they're bringing things to me. Now that has saved me money because I'm not grabbing everything off the shelves, you know, you know, you have the list in your head, the list that you've written down, and then the list that you see as you walk through the store. So that has saved me some money. You know, I also do, um, you know, do everything online, and then they bring the groceries to me. But the only places that I really go, because I don't have a job anymore where I actually have to leave the house, and I probably won't have it after this, because I took off and they told me that I couldn't. Right, but that was, this was this important to me for me to come today and I might lose my job because of it. But the reality of the situation is, is you've already started creating a two tier society. There are people who cannot move about freely. I bought tickets to go see Sting to take my sister for her 50th birthday last year and the concert was canceled. Now I paid almost a thousand dollars for three sets of tickets. Now, because of all of this COVID vaccination and, and stuff like that, and you've got to show proof of your back, I probably won't be able to go to that concert. See, to me, I know people who fought to be free. And I'm not trying to make this a racial issue, but I would argue that, that there is a disproportionate number of people in this room 
who do not have a history of that. And so they take their freedom for granted, okay. right? I never thought that I would have to fight this fight, but I'm willing to do it because I think that we're already starting to see that. In this past year, I go to church, I came here, and every once in a while I'll creep into a store and hopefully like I'm the invisible man, you know, Ralph Ellison's invisible man, hopefully nobody will see me as I walk through to try to get what I need to get. I don't want to live like that. To me, freedom is more important than anything else. And I think that it's sad that we're even in a situation where we have to write a bill in order for people to be free. We are in the most powerful nation on this planet. It was created by people in 1776 who fought against tyranny in government. And now we're revisiting the same types of things because people are too afraid to stand. They want to be free. I don't know if that answered the question, but. No, thank you. Appreciate it. Before we proceed with questioning, there needs to be a clarification. Um, the chair likes Sting. <laughs> so you want my tickets? Is that what you're saying? You you want me, you want you gotta have to sit with my sister and her. I'm, and I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I in love case him too. We could talk later. Um, <laughs> so again, we're off track, and it's Representative Sorry. Young's fault. It's not my fault. Um, uh, at this time, Representative Liston. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Thank you for your testimony. Um, just sort of clarification about the scope. This bill applies to all vaccines, not just COVID. It applies to the meningitis that's that or meningitis vaccine that young people get when they go to college. It applies. Mm -hmm. There are many parts of the bill that applies to school vaccines. Mm -hmm. it, would you apply your testimony to those as well? Those have been around for a long time. No, I would not. And the reason why is because the vaccine or the shot or whatever you want to call it that's co connected to COVID is not being treated in the same way as things in the past. We were not told, you know, one of my aunts is a physician. The first three kids, she vaccinated them with all the vaccinations and went through the recommendations. She saw some issues. And so with her fourth child, she did the same thing that Ms. Abbott did. She did one shot at a time. But we're still not in a situation where with previous shots, based on my limited medical experience, we're not in a situation with those types of treatments as we are with COVID. You've never had to prove that you had um, a meningitis shot in order to be able to go to the grocery store. You know, um, Representative Russo mentioned the idea that, well, we have all of these things in Ohio that say, well, if you've got these exemptions, then you shouldn't have to do this. I can tell you from personal experience, my husband has a medical exemption, and his school told him that they weren't going to accept it. They said about his physician, well, she's a nice lady, but they don't have medical degrees. They don't know what my husband's history is. He's forced to wear a mask every day, even though he has a medical exemption. So this stuff about, oh, well, we've got all this stuff in there to protect people, it's not protecting people because people don't care. Even the governor said, well, you know, you have to understand there are going to be some people out there, this was last year, who have exemptions and we need to be, you know, kind. We shouldn't ask them or whatever. People still ask, you know. So to me, I don't see how, if you're thinking about historically, what's going on in the United States and internationally that this is not going to end up if people are forced to do things against their will. We have no sovereignty over our own bodies. And to me, that's not civil rights. So just refocusing then, apply the testimony to the COVID, but we're not really talking about school children vaccines, et cetera, or, you know, as what you're discussing, just to, I want to apply your testimony to the correct portions of the bill. Okay. Um, and so, yes, am I right on that? That just to clarify what you're talking about is the COVID component, not the broader components. I'm that. talking about the COVID component. Thank yes. you very much. Sorry. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm sorry. I repeated myself. Sometimes I do that just to make sure that That's my okay. point, are, you know, my thoughts. But came I think out any really. future thing, if it's going to be handled in the same way, nothing has been handled like, like no other vaccines have been handled like this one. Thank and you. that's my problem okay. with this. It's a slippery slope. Representative Gross. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Um, Chairman, Chairman Lips to Dr. Smith. 
Um, we know now that there are 14 vaccines required to immigrate into the United States. We also know that there are three exemptions, mm -hmm. conscientious, religious, and medical exemptions for mm -hmm. all of those vaccines to immigrate into the United States. Can you tell me, if we would provide those freedoms to stay free in Ohio, can you tell me your thoughts about staying here? Or can you surmise, perhaps, about what would happen to Ohio if we do not provide freedoms in Ohio? Is it possible that things could change and we would leave Ohio and return back to states such as Florida? I think that that's very um, possible. Um, I have friends at uh, the church that I currently attend, and they came from war torn countries in um, Russia, um, Ukraine, places like that for freedom. And one of the things that they've been talking about is, you know, if the United States falls and we no longer have the freedoms that we have so graciously enjoyed because of people who have stood up for freedom, where will we go? You know, I right now can't leave to go to Florida. Um, but if things change in Ohio, I would be willing to leave. I want to be someplace where I can be free. It's as simple as that. And if Ohio can't provide that, then so far we still have the ability to move freely. But with vaccine passports showing our papers like, you know, to go from one plantation to another, Massa wants to see your papers or whatever else, if that ends up being the case, then we won't be able to leave to go someplace else. Thank you. You, you are welcome to go to Warren County. <laughs> Listen, I just moved from Cuyahoga County to Medina, and the reason why I moved to Medina was because they were more conservative and they were more free. I can shoot on my land, you know. My, it only takes my husband a half an hour to be able to get to work. If we had moved to someplace else, I would have moved further, you know, if I had been able to, but we couldn't. So. Representatives, thank you for your patience and understanding, but we are going to move. Um, thank you for your testimony, and thank you for being with us today. At this time, we'd like to call Dr. Doctor, welcome to committee. Thank okay. you.